I'd like to express my thanks to, to ITU and to, to Global Automakers and, and to TIA for in, inviting me here to, to talk to you about uh, connected vehicles and, and, and spectrum. It's an important, important topic as, uh, as you've gathered already. Uh, it's one of the reasons you're here. So I, it's a, just a pleasure to be here to, to discuss our work in the Joint Program Office and, and our research on how we're incorporating communications uh, technology into the transportation sector. Today I'll be talking about spectrum and very specifically about DSRC, or dedicated <laughs> short-range communications. And I'm going to talk about the significance of 5.9 gigahertz, uh, uh, the, the 5.9 gigahertz environment that we've been developing for some time and that's essential to our efforts in collision avoidance. I can't stress enough how excited I am, how, how we all are at the Department of Transportation and this is a particularly exciting time in both ITS and in the connected vehicle space. Um, but what we're really excited about is the transformational nature of connected vehicles and the technology and the promise that it holds for the future of transportation. Our research at USDOT has shown us, as you've heard today already, that there's the potential to reduce up to 80% of the unimpaired collisions, and that's a tremendous number. And just imagine the number of lives that can be saved as a result of deploying that technology. So connected vehicle technology has the potential to improve the overall efficiency of our transportation system, easing congestion, lessening travel time, as well as improving fuel efficiency. So there are more than just the safety benefits. There are a lot of benefits to this technology. These transformations, however, are predicated on reliable access to the 5.9 gigahertz wireless spectrum. 5.9 gigahertz DSRC provides the speed, reliability, and security needed for connected vehicle safety. We've demonstrated through, the, through years of comprehensive, te comprehensive testing in places like Ann Arbor and Southeast Michigan, and I see Peter Sweatman's here from Umtree. He's very familiar with the work out there. Uh, among other test beds around the nation and test sites that we've worked at, we've made sure that this technology is ready for deployment. So this morning I'd like to discuss how DSRC meets our transportation needs and to consider the ongoing evolution in this field and how it might impact and provide opportunities for further growth and deployment of connected vehicles. So a decade of research and development advancements in DSRC technologies, including device development and testing, channel testing, applications development and testing, as well as architecture and standards development and testing, notice a lot of testing has gone into this program, provide a near comprehensive set of results as a basis for deployment. So let's start with a brief history of DSRC. Going back to 1999, when stakeholders requested that the Federal Communications Commission provide primary use allocation for 5.85 to 5.925 gigahertz in that portion of that spectrum. Today's successful use of 5.9 gigahertz is governed by service rules that are documented in FCC's report and order of 2004, as amended in 2006, and these rules define a band plan that require transportation to develop specific protocols to coexist with other primary users. This coexistence is built into our technologies and we're sharing the spectrum already with those licensed users. Further, using these rules and band plan, the USDOT and its industry partners, test partners, test bed operators, stakeholders have performed rigorous research and analysis that's led to the development and testing of new DSRC protocols, technologies, applications, and standards that are proven to operate according to FCC rules and that are further proven to be interoperable. Certification test procedures are based on these rules. In addition to the emergence of these new cooperative technologies, new institutional arrangements have emerged, specifically with regard to security and privacy. We're in the final stages of developing the performance specifications, architecture viewpoints, and additional standards to support the new policies, such as the National Highway Traffic Safety, Safety Administration's rulemaking, which we anticipate out in 2016, and the Federal Highway's guidance. We've achieved this status at a time when many test beds and pilot deployments have put DSRC into use for research purposes and are preparing plans to transition to operational uses. 
we not only have an ongoing operational prototype environment in Southeast Michigan, but the Secretary <laughs> himself announced the expansion of additional connected vehicle pilot deployment sites around the nation in New York City, Tampa, Florida, and Wyoming just this past September. I'd like to stress a critical point about DSRC. DSRC is a complete package of protocols, performance characteristics, and institutional support structures. It's easy to just think of DSRC, or it's easy to link DSRC to the physical medium of Wi-Fi as defined by 802.11p uh, and that portion of the standard. However, 802.11p is a subset of an entire DSRC package. 802.11p is a physical media medium upon which we transmit. DSRC is a complete uh, protocol package that includes specifications for physical medium, but adds much more to the complex to meet the complex needs of a compre comprehensive and highly mobile integrated intelligent transportation system. It includes, for example, stable proven standards that support two different types of transmissions broadcast and internet protocol transfer in a manner that's interoperable, cooperative among all trusted players. Technical and policy controls as part of a trust model that authenticates all messages before applications act upon them is also included. Additionally, a design for coexistence with other primary spectrum users and mitigations related to dealing with the noise and congestion that we expect when operating in a dedicated ban. And very importantly, new organizational structures within OEMs, within state and local roadway agencies, accommodate new policies and controls. And then finally, certification pre procedures, which reflect all of these needs with test procedures. We now have testable requirements that reflect the entire package. So let's discuss the key requirements that make up part of this package. First, there's our requirement for broadcast mode. The requir this requirement addresses one of the more unique aspects of a connected vehicle environment, the crash avoidance capabilities. Both V2V and V2I, as well as V2P and even V2X in the near future. Now, I know that's a lot of V, but I think you're all familiar with them. Of course, V2X, which is really the V to everything, not just connections to vehicles and infrastructures and pedestrians, but all of the devices that would be operating in the transportation environment. So one of the key benefits of broadcast mode is that it provides a democratic, economical distribution of common data units throughout a highly mobile environment that accounts not only for vehicle speeds, but also for multipath issues. When you think about a complete connected vehicle environment, some of you might envision our reference implementation architecture. Broadcast mode fulfills the requirements of this very specific set of unique applications. To date, no one has been able to come up with a better, more mature alternative to meet our overall needs. It's more than just a medium. Broadcast mode fulfills the need for a highly complex mobile environment. So similarly, similarly, we have specific requirements to fill the many needs of other priority connected vehicle environment applications. We do this with peer-to-peer -peer mode. Peer-to-peer -peer mode supports system optimization applications such as maintenance, management, tolling, commercial oversight, enforcement, misbehavior reporting, certificate revocation, certificate revocation, list distribution, and similar types of applications. Notably, these are all activities that people would like to accomplish when one of the peers is a moving vehicle. Again, to date, no medium fills all of the complex needs associated with peer-to-peer -peer communications in a highly mobile environment such as vehicle transportation. Thus the nation, just the notion of switching the 802.11p 802 medium or opening up the band to sharing is disruptive to the program ecostructure eco that we've created over this past decade. Careful research is needed to ensure that the DSRC package of characteristics and benefits are preserved, particularly from a safety of life perspective, as we consider adding any new features, such as sharing a different or new medium. We believe that sharing is a benefit to transportation, but we've gone down this transformative path to engender significant benefits 
and safety and system optimization and believe that these benefits are critical are of critical importance to the nation and any changes require careful governance and public stewardship to ensure that they are properly preserved. So it might be useful to stop and articulate what we see as the differences between our connected vehicle technologies versus the types of application that exist to allow people to be connected. We're not talking about cars wired with telephones or internet access. Connected vehicles provide a complete connected intelligent transportation system. Our version of connectivity ensures that interoperability exists among all makes and models of devices and vehicles and systems. It's imperative that they share common basic safety information. Another significant characteristic of our version of connectivity is that the incorporation of privacy and security is part of the design of the technologies as well as part of the operations. Our version of connectivity also engenders an open data environment which provides rich and detailed data sets that do not exist today and have a power <laughs> capacity to transform roadway and infrastructure operations. Importantly, we recognize that all, not all applications require DSRC for connectivity or to be a part of the connected vehicle ecosystem. For those applications associated with safety and system optimization or other transportation mm -hmm. priorities, we have very specific requirements and those requirements will ensure that we make use of the bandwidth on a regular basis. However, other applications that don't have such strict requirements can use other media which offer their own other useful characteristics. Over the years, DOT has regularly performed comprehensive analysis of communications options to ensure that multiple choices would be available for use within connected vehicle environments. Our research with the American Association of State and Highway Transportation Officials, in particular, demonstrates opportunities that use other commercially available wireless, uh, other commercially available wireless data communications technologies, such as cellular, satellite, entertainment radio, fiber, and Wi-Fi, among others, in support of applications that do not require the extreme low latency and fast network access connection times or characteristics that support communications in a highly mobile environment as afforded by DSRC. These ap applications can operate outside of the DSRC environment, but we note that communications aren't necessarily interoperable or cooperative in nature. So our focus in using DSRC in an optimal manner for these applications that require interoperability, security, and privacy to enable transportation priorities to be met while many of the elements are moving at highway speeds. So that's critical to us because that is the transportation environment. We recognize the changes are happening within the telecommunications industry, and we're looking at these evolutions to better understand what opportunities exist to complement our DSRC package. Our spectrum and policy engineers are performing analysis to best optimize uh, and to understand how to best optimize the use of dedicated spectrum to meet transportation priorities. Some of the innovations being worked on within the industry that, are, that we're tracking include spectrum sharing, such as detect and vacate capabilities and development, as well as seamless use of all media available through things such as LTE, 5G, and other new developmental protocols. However, it's not yet clear how these new innovations will meet our requirements, if at all. We're aware that some in the industry are defining use cases, but have not fully defined requirements <laughs> that would lead to standards and policies needed to put these new media into place for transportation. We also note that new emerging media are on a timeline that's very different from connected vehicles deployment. We're launching these new technologies now. With newly awarded CV pilot sites, we expect operations in 2016 to make full use of spectrum that is allocated to DSRC for cooperative uses. Of course, we're always eager to better understand emerging technologies, especially those that may affordably enhance safety, mobility, and efficiency in the transportation sector. To the extent that you can share data as to how these new media will meet transportation requirements, that would be helpful. As the physical medium evolves, we'll need to assess the, assess the implications of maturing, uh, mature, uh, assess the implications of maturing technologies and study the impacts to the other elements of the connected vehicle ecosystem. These elements need to evolve in a stable fashion 
to ensure that the tremendous gains we've made with security, privacy, trust organizational, ch trust organizational changes, and efficiency of use remain as benefits for the nation. In the future, we anticipate that various wireless data communications technologies may, may migrate to an end-to-end -end portfolio of media where all forms of communication will be part of a larger federated communication concept, allowing devices to use the communications that are most appropriate at the time. As such, DOT is working to ensure that DSRC becomes a part of this portfolio while still pres preserving the characteristics that are critical to ensuring a, a safe, secure, and private connected vehicle environment. As we look towards the future, we're also looking at near-term steps that are necessary to support deployment of connected vehicle technology. As many of you know, we're performing spectrum tests based on a test plan released in September of this year. There are two objectives to this testing. First, with the emergence of some sharing concepts, we're preparing our tests to be able to test new unlicensed technologies that are under consideration that have the potential to share our allocation. At present, it's unclear when this may be economically viable. Possibly when connected vehicle technologies are not in use, maybe during quiet or night times, or even during the milliseconds of non-use between application use, if such technologies can be developed and be proven to be effective through testing. It's an exciting opportunity, but one that needs to be tested carefully, given the safety of life nature of connected vehicle applications. And second, uh, we, we are conducting these tests to provide a baseline of the environments in which we'll be deploying and operating. Our tests along the way have helped us to develop standards and algorithms, and now's the time for us to finalize this portion of the testing to ensure that the appropriate propagation models exist to continue to simulate and model this environment. So this testing is taking place as new pilot sites have been awarded, and the opportunity to build a, now, their, their environment for connected vehicle operations exists. As I've mentioned earlier, three sites have been chosen, including uh, using, uh, and include using connected vehicle technologies to improve safe and efficient truck movement along I-80 in southern Wyoming, exploiting V2V and intersection communications to improve vehicle flow and pedestrian safety in high priority corridors in New York, uh, New York City, and deploying multiple safety and mobility applications on and in proximity to reversible lanes, uh, uh, freeway lanes in Tampa, Florida. These sites have launched their work to develop their architectures and will complete it in 2016. While these states and local partners advance connected vehicle operations, USD agencies, uh, USDOT agencies are working to finalize policies, regulations, and standards such as the NHTSA rulemaking and the Federal Highways Guidance, as well as DSRC licensing guides to be published in early 2016. And the OEMs and aftermarket firms are preparing for a wider scale deployment with the first significant commercial offerings coming in months. So in conclusion, in all, 2015 has been a busy year and we expect 2016 to be equally intense. Exciting new ITS procurement activities are being crafted. And if you, some of you may have seen the Secretary's interview in Wired Magazine or seen the notice of funding opportunity that was announced yesterday or uh, may have already signed up for the Smart Cities uh, event that we're going to be holding at the Department of Transportation uh, in uh, next Monday. Now, this, when I originally wrote this, it was, it was not going to refer to all those things, but fortunately the Secretary made his announcement, so I strongly encourage you uh, to come to this event. We're putting $40 million in activity into a next round of deployments uh, for, for smart cities. And this deployment will help realize the connected vehicle vision. And thanks to congressional interest and support for intelligent transportation systems, even more deployments are on the horizon. The outcome of our efforts will be a significant advancement in connected vehicle technologies and operations in the near term. But let me assure you that as some of my staffers are, are very focused on these near-term advancements based on stable, proven DSRC uh, packages, others are focused on the opportunities that your industry's work and new media might offer in the future. So thank you for your attention. If we have a few minutes, uh, myself and some of the technical staff from the ITS Joint Program Office would be delighted to take any questions you might have. 
So I guess it depends a little bit by what you mean the DSRC rollout. The Department of Transportation has invested nearly $600 million in developing DSRC technologies and all the protocols and the whole connected vehicle environment that I've, I've talked about. And the connected vehicle pilot sites that I talked about and the smart cities activity that are going to continue to advance some of that technology and, and, and among others are funded by the ITS Joint Program Office through the work that we perform with our modal partners and with industry. So we, we put a lot of work out to mature this technology. Um, the department, however, also puts out a lot of grant money, billions and billions of dollars in grant money through federal highways, through uh, federal transit, uh, through NHTSA and, and other mod modal uh, deployments. So those funds can also be used to fund the rollout of technology. But we also anticipate that as states, for example, um, you know, we do anticipate with a, with, a, with a regulation that the devices would be in vehicles, so the vehicle-to-vehicle vehicle vehicle rollout will largely happen as people either replace their vehicles or if they choose to deploy, uh, add in an aftermarket, and an aftermarket, a consumer would pay to do that. On the infrastructure side, um, states, localities, and federal resources support the upgrade and maintenance of uh, V2V infrastructure, and so all ITS programs are eligible for U.S. Department of Transportation grants, so I'm sure that some of those funds will also be used by states and localities as they roll out the technology. I think that answers your question. Uh, Tom Gage from Marconi Pacific. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the SCMS? the security credential management system sure. concept that uh, you issued an RFI for, I guess, what, about a year ago? That sounds there, about It's right. been, it, it, I, I haven't kept up with it exactly, but I'm not sure there's been too much activity. I'm wondering what's going on. And oh, well, maybe, there, maybe you should, uh, I, I, you could probably do a better job of describing it for people who aren't familiar with it than I Well, I, I'll just give a fairly quick description. Yes, it, it, this is an important component of the connected vehicle environment. Um, we developed a prototype SCMS that uh, has been operating in Ann Arbor. We recognize that while that research prototype uh, demonstrated the, the capability, we really need an operational SCMS uh, as, as we scale up into operations. So our, our next phase and the deployment we put out was basically to create a scalable um, security certificate management system, which is essentially really the largest mobile PKI environment. Uh, I, I think that's fair to say. Uh, I don't think there's a larger one that exists. Uh, and, and our procurement uh, is out to uh, make one uh, that can accommodate. Uh, we started it with 17 million vehicles, but with the notion that that would be scalable. So this is actually an area where we see, we don't necessarily see a need for the government to run the SCMS. We think this is a tremendous opportunity for the private sector to step up and participate in this. Much like the financial industry in the US relies heavily on uh, the credit bureaus to establish financial, uh, it's kind of a trust network that uh, establishes you know, credit scores and things like that, and it facilitates trusted operations. It makes it possible for all of us to use our credit cards and to get those lovely offerings in the mail to get even more credit cards. Essentially, uh, and the analogy breaks down a little bit, but the SCMS <laughs> allows vehicles to trust the information coming from all the other vehicles around them to make sure that it's secure and accurate information. And those credit bureaus are not run by the U.S. government and they're not run by the financial institutions. They're supported by them to create that environment that is really the lubricant in the financial system. And the SCMS is essentially a, a part of that lubrication to keep the connected vehicle environment working in a trusted fashion. And that's essential to the operation. 
All right, David Pickerel, uh, Chief Strategy Officer of TriMeta. Uh, I just wanted to ask a quick, quick question, question, Ken. Leaving aside FAST, which of course the ink is barely dry on, and what you guys are going to be covering next week at the Smart Cities Summit, are there any kind of things to watch or things we want to pay attention to as we head into TRB, the 95th TRB in a month from now, in terms of things we, uh, you, you would recommend us paying attention to, both as industry people and as, as fellow government people? Well, I'm not going to comment uh, specifically on on FAST because we're still in the process of, of reading through that, and understanding everything we have to everything we have to do to, to comply with that legislation. But you know, I, I would say you know, if you haven't read our strategic plan, I would look at that. Um, connected vehicles, automated vehicles, enterprise data, and smart cities. Uh, again, if you haven't seen the secretary's announcement, and Scott, I think you said you. You might have some uh, information on that later in the day, um, you know. So, you, so you'll get some more information on that. I think those are all very important things to stay stay tuned for. Haven't prepared my remarks yet for TRB, but uh, but it, some of these uh, topics, connected vehicles, smart cities, will be chief among the things we'll be talking about uh, in in 2016. Hey, one last question. Um, this is an online question. Um, from the live streaming, um, do you foresee that LTE peer-to-peer -peer may become a de facto replacement to DSRC due to LTE's readily available infrastructure and fulfilling all technical requirements for V2V and V2X communication needs? Well, I, I, I think I indicated in my remarks that I, I don't think we're convinced yet that LTE, um, that we know enough about LTE and its maturity to, to replace the environment that we've we've spent over a decade building in DSRC. Now, certainly, um, we'd like to know more about uh, that. I under, you know I understand from re my review of the background literature on LTE and 5G that there's still a lot of work going on in that area, um, and and I, I think there's maybe not a uniformity of opinion within the community about the state of maturity of that technology, but. Uh, the one thing I know from having worked in technology for for over 30 years that technologies will evolve, uh, will, will evolve, and what we'll be talking about in five years, and 10 years, and 15 years, certainly LTE and 5G and those technologies will be in a completely new place than they are today. And so uh, I certainly wouldn't rule out that those technologies have a future in the transportation sector. I just don't see them at this point. Uh, given where we are uh, with regard to connected vehicle deployments, that they're ready to step in and fill that role today. Hi, I'm Russ Shields, the ITU side of this. The discussion is not to replace DSRC. DSRC stays, and all of the environment about DSRC stays. The only discussion is whether the simple bearer protocol moves to LTE direct versus 802.11p since 802.11p is more than 15 years old. But all of your environment about DSRC stays the same. And so I guess we'll have to see where LTE, where LTE is in that level of maturity and whether that environment um, is mature enough yet to, to, to be adopted. But at this point, it's not what we're looking at um, uh, for, for deployment. 